I'm Justin. Um, I'll try to speed through this talk to make up on lost time. That's an example of fail-slow behavior. And fail-slow behavior is challenging uh, because it often leads to overload, which can happen in unexpected ways. So take, for example, global pandemics. During COVID-19, countries started implementing lockdown procedures, and many people rushed to use our apps because they couldn't talk to each other in person. This led to a nearly 40% load increase compared to before the pandemic, shown by the orange line compared to the blue line, which was our best capacity forecast going into the pandemic. Now, the challenge was product demand was increasing so much, yet at the same time, the available buffer capacity in our fleet was actually decreasing due to global supply chain shortages. What this means is that in distributed systems, when the demand for resources exceeds the supply, you enter into an overload spiral where machines start to exhibit fail-slow behavior, they're not able to respond to requests, and load balancers attempt to shift the load to other data centers only to cause those data centers to start failing as well. And so we asked ourselves, can we prevent this overload behavior without adding additional resources. But before I get into the details, a quick show of hands. Who here has ever encountered a broken escalator? Okay, so most of you. It turns out you're already experts on graceful degradation because a broken escalator, even though leads to worse user impact because we have to actually use our legs to go upstairs, it still is able to implement its critical features, which is getting us from one level to the next. So with that key idea in mind, if there's something that you take away from this talk, I hope that it's these three points. The first is that in order to make sure that we could keep our critical features in our products available, even during overload scenarios, we needed to disable our non-critical features, and I'll describe how we do that. In addition, we can't just disable features randomly because this would lead to high user impact. We had to carefully trade off between impact and capacity. And finally, it wasn't enough to just be prepared with a plan. We actually had to validate our approach in production and at scale. For the rest of this talk, I'll talk about a design pattern we made for graceful degradation, a framework we used to measure the trade-offs, and a site-wide outage that we averted because of DEF CON. I'll start our journey with an observation that not all features are actually created equal. In Meta's apps, there's certain features that we consider as critical, like the ability to send and receive messages, and certain that are non-critical, for example, notifications, complex feed ranking, and also search. These will vary depending on the app that you're talking about, but for Meta's apps, these are the types of non-critical features. Our key idea is to define something called knobs that basically are able to encapsulate the control flow of non-critical features and enable us to dynamically turn that control flow on or off during emergency scenarios. One key thing that I want you to understand for the rest of this talk is that features at Meta are implemented as RPC requests. So for example, if I take out my phone and open up the Threads app, I'm gonna send an HTTP GET request to a virtual IP address that maps to a server in one of Meta's data centers. That server is going to perform some computation and arrange the post to send back to the client where it's able to render those posts in my app. The key thing that I want to point out here is that most of the complexity and the resource utilization for this feature is actually implemented in a relatively isolated and small critical section of code on the server. And we're going to use that to build a technique around it. And here's how it would work. For the same post ranking feature that I just described, we would basically perform these three steps. On line one, we would fetch the posts. On line two, we would rank them using a complex model. And on line three, we would return the post to the apps. What if during a disaster, we could actually dynamically change the control flow to do something much less resource intensive? How would we do that? 
Well, the first step is to actually define this feature as a knob. We have to convert it to be a knob. And to do that, we need to give it a name. So we'll give it the name a post ranking. The second thing to do is to check the status of this knob using a conditional statement in our source code. We check to see if the knob is enabled or disabled. The key thing I want to point out here is that if the, if the knob is enabled, which is the default state, the control flow is exactly the same as before. However, notice that if the knob is disabled, such as during a disaster, we would actually bypass the complex portion of the code and return the posts in a random order that we fetched from the backing store. Now, randomly returning posts might not be great for user experience. So a key third step of our procedure is to try and implement a fallback that is able to get the best of both worlds, minimizing resource utilization while also providing utility to the people using our apps. And in this case, we could use a resource efficient chronological ranking for the posts. Now, because different knobs can have different levels of impact, we find it helpful to classify them into different levels. And here's the four levels that we use. DEF CON level four is just business as usual. No degradation is going on. DEF CON level three achieves low savings, and we typically use this for brief demand spikes. DEF CON level two yields a medium level of savings, and we'll typically use these for larger demand surges. DEF CON level one yields the most resource savings, but also has the highest impact on our user experience. And so we'll typically only use this level of DEF CON for once in a lifetime disasters. To anchor this in real data, this is the levels that we use for the Facebook app at Meta. Levels are very helpful as an abstraction because it helps product teams figure out what they need to target in terms of resource savings at a given level of impact. Defining a knob is really easy too. Every knob has a name like we saw, and it also has a team that's responsible for maintaining the knob. One of the things that we found was that this was critical for federating our approach across the company so that we could enable it to be used broadly and very pervasively throughout our infrastructure. Knobs also have a level of impact like we talked about and a default state, which in this case is true or enabled. Now, once we were able to control individual knobs, a key challenge for us was how to scale this approach to the thousands of microservices and teams of hundreds of engineers that ultimately are developing products on our platform. And by the way, this is all going on while the code is in a constant state of change and flux. On top of that, our microservice architecture has a complex net of transitive dependencies, and so we needed a, rate, a way to reason about how degrading one particular service would trickle down into resource savings for other dependent services later in their dependence chain. To, to basically accomplish both of these challenges, we developed an automated testing framework that takes knobs and metrics that correspond to resource savings as an input, and every so often we'll go through every knob and actually enable it for a small fraction of users in our entire app ecosystem. And what it does during this time is it's measuring how much do the resources change. And it uses this information to both store test results for later analysis and provide actionable insights to product teams about the knobs that they've defined. Now, that's all great, but we need to make sure that this mechanism works when we need it. And so for that, we have regular production testing and validation in our fleet. We have weekly A-B tests where for a subset of knobs, we have control groups and test groups and we measure user impact changes. We have quarterly full-scale tests, and then we have scenario-based tests for the events that we can predict, like New Year's Eve or even World Cup. Here's an example of resource savings that we measure for a subset of knobs that are defined for the Facebook app. There's a couple of things to note from this. The first is that you can see going from DEF CON level three in dark aqua to DEF CON level one in gray, there's a large span in resource savings. This makes sense because DEF CON level one is ultimately trading off more user impact 
for more resource savings. You can also see that across different features, we see different levels of savings. Now, these savings come at a cost, as I mentioned, and that cost is user experience that we're trading off. You can see here four metrics that we typically measure during these tests. The first is user interaction, which is how many events people are doing and when they're using our apps. The second is newsfeed usage, which is the number of posts that people are reading as they scroll through their feed. The third is video watch time, the number of seconds that they spend watching videos. The fourth is app usage time, overall time spent using the apps. You can see that at DEF CON level one, which is what these savings were, these trade-offs were measured at, the trade-offs can actually be quite large, so we don't want to use them very frequently. One interesting thing that I want to point your attention to, however, is the fact that resource, that when we enable graceful degradation, we often see workload shifts. You can see that when we enable DEF CON level one, people actually spend more time viewing video content. The reason for this is that people will find creative ways to spend their time on our apps, even when our features are degraded. So how does this all work at scale? Well, we built a knob actuator service that is able to control and coordinate and orchestrate the usage of knobs across all of the apps that we have. And this actuator service is controlled by a CLI that site operators and incident managers use during emergency scenarios. It also publishes information about what DEF CON is doing to a web-based portal so that site responders can actually monitor what's going on in real time. Now, to tie, every, to tie everything together, I want to show you a real-world example that we use DEF CON to avert a site-wide outage. What we're seeing here on the top dark blue line is the measured amount of demand for the Facebook app on a particular day. And the light blue line below it is a typical amount of demand for a day, just shown for reference. You can see toward the left and the right some brief spikes. These are due to pushes of the binary, where we actually deployed a new version into production. When we deploy a new version, we have to take down some capacity, and it has to warm up. And so cold cache effects will increase the amount of resource usage during those deployments. But I want to draw your attention to this spike here. We actually had a configuration change on this day that introduced an extremely expensive query to every request from the Facebook app. And this led to a large increase in resource utilization, which, as I mentioned before, triggered a cascading overload spiral, where we saw servers in data centers not able to handle the, uh, their normal amount of requests. Load balancers start shifting load to other data centers, and thereby overloading the servers in those data centers, and so on. We enabled DEF CON during this event first at level three and then at level two. And we were able to actually bend the resource demand curve back to what we would see on a normal day. 30 minutes later, we disabled DEF CON as site operators had mitigated the root cause. We've been using DEF CON in production for around four years. And I just want to briefly share a few lessons that we've learned during that time. The first is that readiness requires regular drills. We can't just build the system and hope that it works when we need it. So we test at production, in production and at scale. The second is that developer efficiency and experience are key. We would not have been able to get this approach as widely adopted if we hadn't focused on how developers would actually use it and be able to test how they use it to get actionable insights. And finally, knobs need to be maintained regularly. It's not enough to simply define a knob and let it sit there. Knobs can get refactored, code can change, and so we need to be prepared. So that's graceful degradation with DEF CON. I'm looking forward to your questions after this talk. And maybe the next time you encounter a broken escalator, you might think a little bit about the benefits of graceful degradation. Thank you.